Good morning, guys. Um, I think my life must be pretty boring at the moment because I actually got excited about a cable arriving today. I've got this 16 millimeter square black cable. So the reason I've been excited about this cable is because I've actually not been able to really make much progress with the rest of electrics without it. But now that it's here, it means that I can show you guys how the rest of the system is gonna to go together. The only thing that's still to come is the battery to battery charger, but I can install that at any point really, especially because the engine's not gonna be running anytime soon. It's not as if I'm gonna be charging from the alternator. So we're gonna crack on today and get more electrics fired in and uh, see how we get on. So these are my two bus bars. Um, they're both rated for 150 amps DC, which means I can attach up to 150 amps worth of power sources to these. Um, at the moment, I've just got the one cable connected to the negative one, and that's been earthed at my grounding point. I'm gonna rig these up to the battery bank now, um, and I'm also gonna connect the solar panel charge controller to it also. So that's now the solar panel charge controller completely disconnected from the batteries. So at the moment, the batteries aren't connected to absolutely anything and the bus bar has its earthing point. So now's the time to run the negative from the last battery onto this negative bus bar. I've got a negative, comes along here, goes up to the bus bar, the negative is in place and it's grounded, which means we can connect the battery to the live bus bar now. So this is the cable that I'm gonna to use to connect the live battery to the live bus bar, uh, 60 millimeter square. It's gonna carry plenty of power, more power than my devices are gonna need. The inverter is the most powerful device I have at a thousand watts, um, and it's likely that I'll connect that directly to the batteries. Keep in mind that all the devices that you connect to the bus bar all need to be fused. In my case, they will be because I'll be connecting this to this fuse box, which is gonna allow me to connect lights and USBs and stuff like that. This is for low power consumption items, such as lights, USBs, etc. The big ticket number in the van is the inverter for my laptop. Everything else is gonna be pretty small. The pump is actually the next biggest thing at six amps and it's all the way down there. And it's running on this uh, 21 amp cable that runs along here, which I'll be connecting to the bus bar shortly. Um, but what I am going to do with this 16 mil cable that's connecting from there to there is I'm going to put a big fat switch and this is going to allow me to disconnect the batteries from everything running off the system. In doing that though the only thing that I really need to keep in mind is that if I'm going to turn this switch off I must turn off the solar first because of course what will happen is when I disconnect this it's going to disconnect the live to that which is going to disconnect the live to my charge controller but if the solar is still coming in then that's not good for the charge controller whatsoever. So when I install this, I might actually put a little bit of masking tape underneath it or something, just saying, do not turn off while solar is on. Also something to consider is that I'm gonna be putting my inverter here. The battery to battery charger is gonna go on this wall over here where it's nice and ventilated because apparently the battery to battery charger gets really hot. Uh, so my inverter is gonna go here, which means I'm gonna want this uh, switch for the main system to probably be there. So I'll run the cable from the battery along the lower edge up into this and then a cable that comes down onto that bar. All right, I'm gonna do a voltmeter check. I've got this set to 20 volts and the switch is in the off position. So there should be nothing coming through this right now. Yeah, zero. If I just turn this switch, that bar should now be live. So doing the exact same test again. 13 volts. So the next step is putting a fuse in this cable that comes from the charge controller and then I can connect that up and then I can connect the solar again and then that should be charging the whole system. But while I'm working on that, of course, I'm gonna disconnect that so that I don't touch my finger across there and get a nasty shock. Right, we're in. We're connected to the bus bars. So I'm just gonna trace all the cables just to kind of show you the, the flow of the power, I suppose. So the free battery is connected, it's coming at the positive goes into this switch, comes out the switch, comes to the bus bar. This is the live bus bar, which I've connected through the positive to the charge controller. I've got a 60 amp fuse in here. It's a 70 amp cable and it's a 40 amp charge controller. So if you imagine the solar panels are pumping out 40 amps, the 70 amp cable can carry that absolutely fine. If something goes wrong, then the 60 amp fuse will blow before the 70 amp cable runs into any issues or catches fire or whatever. Then we've got the negative coming out here, comes along and then connects up to the bus bar. The bus bar 
is connected to the negative of the last battery and it has its earth point that goes all the way under there to the chassis. So what should happen is when I turn this switch on, the power is going to feed into the bus bar and it's going to turn this on. It's saying that we've got the batteries on 12.9, but it's saying that the solar panels are currently in night mode, as in they're not receiving any signal. So let's go ahead and flick this breaker back on, and then we should see the solar power come in. Yep, there's the little sun symbol. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I was wondering why it wasn't showing the amps there. Wow. Holy crap. That's a lot of power. It is proper, like, sunny now. So that means there's 20 amps running down this cable through the fuse. The fuse isn't breaking because it can carry 60. It's going into the bus bar, which can carry 150. And then it's going to the batteries. So the next thing I'm going to wire in is actually going to be this fuse box. So all I need is a positive lead to the positive side, which is actually this side, and a negative lead to the negative. So these fuse boxes are brilliant because they let you fuse individual items. So if I had lights, USB 1, USB 2, or whatever, I can fuse them independently depending on what that system should really rely on. And then it allows you to use different gauges of wire, uh, which is obviously gonna save you a lot of money when you use the correct wire. But for now, we have a fully functioning solar system and I have access to the power. Good afternoon guys. Uh, so today's mission is installing a pure sine wave inverter. So when it comes to inverters, you can get cheap ones and they tend to be modulated wave, which means that they kind of, they pretend to be sine wave. I'll, I'll put a drawing on the screen right now to kind of explain how they fake sine wave basically. So that works fine if you charge in your razor or you know, you've just got a small device plugged in. But something like a laptop, you really don't want to be running on those cheaper inverters, not at all. You need to make sure and get a pure sine wave inverter, which provides the electrical signal that your laptop charger and your laptop want. So this is a thousand watt inverter with 2000 watt surge. So what that means is it can run a thousand watts continuously and it won't have a problem, but it can surge up to 2000. Quite a lot of electrical systems, when you power them on, they use a little bit more when they start up compared to when they're running. So an example of that is like light bulbs in houses, you know, those big fluorescent tubes. I'm pretty sure they draw more power when you turn them on than when they're running because they have to kind of warm up, so to speak. So it's the same with this. You know, when you connect some devices, they will take more than a thousand watts. So it's got that surge value on it. A thousand watts is going to do me absolutely fine because the only thing I'm going to run off of this is my laptop, which is rated about 180 watts, but it's still well under that 1000 watt threshold for this. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's the only thing that we need 240 volt AC. But uh, yeah, basically you kind of want to push the budget on your inverter because otherwise you'll buy it twice. I bought a 600 watt one for my old van, which should have done my laptop absolutely fine. That's three times the amount of wattage and it died within a few months. So I always go well above what you think you need. Um, and you're just more likely to get a better lifespan out of it. So in the box, you get the inverter itself, which is quite a big and heavy item. You get your cables, so you get your negative lead, your positive lead. You also get an earth cable. You get a switch so that you can power it on and off without having to go to the inverter itself. A little pack of these kind of feet grommet things. And of course you get your instruction manual. So it's pretty simple to set these things up really. Interestingly, it doesn't come with a fuse on the live lead, but I do know that this comes fused already. So I'm not gonna fuse this. I'm gonna trust the fuses inside. So it's pretty straightforward to be honest. You've got a positive, a negative, and an earthing point. Um, and they all need to be connected to the right place. On the other side, we've got your socket, which you'll connect your devices to. Then you've got an on or off button. You've got the socket for where the switch is gonna go in and you've got a USB port for charging them from. Uh, you've also got a couple of lights which are gonna display errors and if the device has power. So it's got a fan on it because this device can get warm. Um, so basically when you're mounting it in the instruction manual, it says not to mount it upright like that because you can have dust particles, sawdust, whatever, falling in the top and likewise on that side. So it has to be mounted on the wall horizontally. So for my location, I'm gonna keep it nice and near the batteries and it's gonna go there. It's plenty ventilated, the fans on this side, there's nothing in the way of it at all. There's plenty of space under the garage. And with the plug socket being on this end, I can just run a very short extension cable to here 
where I can plug in my devices. This is going straight to the batteries. So I need to make sure that these leads are gonna reach. I recommend that you watch my earlier videos to understand how my system works, but if you haven't, then I'll just explain that when these are in parallel, you want to be taken from the opposite positive and the opposite negative. It only applies if you've got more than one battery. If you've only got one battery, you obviously go into the positive and the negative. But in this instance, we're going to be taking the positive off of this battery and the negative off of this. If you only had two batteries, you take the positive off of one of them and the negative off of the other one. So the first step is going to be mounting this to the wall. I've got the little feet that come with it. I've got some screws that are long enough to go through the feet and, and into my plywood board. So these little feet go on like so. And then I'll just screw my screws straight through the feet. So feet on first. There we go. Four little feet. So, yep, time to screw it onto the wall. Should have read the instructions really, but you must have to screw these on first. The top one's the important one because I can't get past the connectors. That one I can, so it's really the top left one that I need to get onto the wall first. So that's now securely in place. Doesn't wobble, doesn't move. So let's get it wired in. So I've put the earth wire here um, and I've brought it down. It just reaches my earth point on the chassis. The butterfly bolt on this is not what keeps it tight. There's a bolt behind that as well. I've just done that as an extra layer because then it pinches against the next bolt. So this is unbelievably sturdy. Nothing can move it. Um, but yeah, this happens to just reach that. But of course, this tiny little eyelet is not gonna go on that big bolt. So I'm gonna cut this off and I'm gonna put a larger connector to it so that I can connect it to this. It's a little bit tight though. I don't like it going under here. So I'm actually gonna take it off that end and just kind of have it run up the wall. Should gain me a little bit of slack so it's not quite as tight going around there. It doesn't really need to be going down in that space either. I'd rather keep it out of the way. All right, with that earth wire successfully installed, uh, the next step is the negative. Always do negative first. So it just twists off and you'll notice the cables have got a small lug and a large lug. So I'm gonna go for the small one. So the only thing I would do is make sure that you're not passing it over the fan. So I'm gonna take the negative out at that sort of angle. While I'm here, I'm gonna connect the positive, but like I say, you always connect the negative first, so the negative will be going to the battery before the positive. So they're both screwed on nice and tight, as tight as I can do it by hand. I'm surprised you don't get bolts for it, really. And then I've got the cables coming out. The size of the terminal on that is ridiculous. It's so huge. So I've got um, a big pack of them, all these different sizes. So I'm actually gonna change it to one that fits that not a lot better than that. Yeah, I've got quite a lot of excess wire, so I can afford to cut that end off and fit a new one on. Next step is connecting the positive, and if you remember, I said it's gonna be that terminal. Not the positive from the same battery, but rather the furthest away one. So we're gonna connect this up to there now. Earth wire connected, negative wire, connected, positive wire connected. But yeah, in theory, this should work. Super awkward angle to film, but this is the power button, so hopefully if I push that, we should get some action. There we go, green light, green means go, and the red one hasn't come on, so there's no error. Now we're just gonna connect the control button into here and see if we can turn it on and off remotely. So this is the little power button. Um, quite a large thing for such a tiny little button and it's got what looks like a phone line cable or something but yeah I'm gonna plug that in and then just test that it works on this end uh, I haven't got anywhere to install this yet because I'm still building the framework but I'll install it now just in case this is the only video you watch of my build and you want to see the very final stage so let's plug it in that's the wire from the inverter and it comes up to the little button to give it a push that way power light will go green and it'll make a beep you heard the beep and you can just make out there's a little green light there. There's no red light under the fault. As far as we can tell it's working but we'll put it to the real test and we'll plug my laptop in and make sure it's getting a charge. I think it's always recommended with inverters that um, you turn them on first so I'm gonna hit the power button, switch is on. So yeah turn it on before you plug in your devices. I don't think it likes to have something powerful plugged in waiting for power. It likes to kind of power up if you know what I mean. So in with my laptop charger. When you're testing your system, I'd always recommend you test it maybe on something not quite as 
valuable as a laptop. <laughs> but it's going to quite clearly show whether it's charging or not. And there we have it. Charging. We are now getting power from the Ledger batteries, which are also connected to the whole solar system. As simple as that. I'll just push the power button off and we've lost charge. Perfect. So that's how you install an inverter in your camper van. It's pretty straightforward and hopefully um, this video will give you some clarity. Um, I'm sure you probably have some questions, drop them in the comments and I'll try to get to them. If not, then hopefully the rest of the community will help you as well because they might have better answers than I do. Right, I'm going to finish up doing some wiring. There's just a couple little things to finish off. Uh, I'm going to connect up this fuse box that I've got and I'm going to put the temperature sensor on for the solar charge controller. I've got it, so I might as well use it. Yeah, and then that's basically it. And then I can just start building the bed. So this fuse box is rated for 100 amps. So I can't put anything more than 100 amps through it. And each of these are individually rated at 20 amps. So if you were to use the full 100, you could only have five of these running on 20 amps. I'm not gonna be using anything of that size. I've got some cable here that's 10 mil, and uh, this is from an old system that I kind of took apart. And it's got a 60 amp fuse in it. So I'm actually gonna use this because I'm not going to use anywhere near 60 amps. The cable can carry more than 60 amps. Um, but yeah, that fuse will go if I draw more than 60 amps out of that, which just isn't going to happen. I did some quick calculations on how much energy I'm going to be drawing in the van. The things that are going to be connected to this fuse box are going to be USBs and lights. And then there's going to be that cable that feeds through to the pump and its own fuse box through there. Um, so I've added up everything, literally all the USBs, all the lights, the ampage of all of them, I figured it at less than 30. So 60 amp fuse with this 10 millimeter cable is gonna be more than efficient for what I'm ever gonna draw off of this system. It means I could have everything on in the van all at the same time and you'd still be absolutely fine. Annoyingly, I don't have any black 10 mil. I've used it all, but I do have this piece of red 10 mil that was cut off of an old system and it's gonna be the perfect length to connect up there. So <laughs> what I'm gonna do is I'm actually just gonna wrap that in black tape so that it's a black cable. There's no difference between the black and the red. They're just copper wire. Um, it's purely appearance, but it's important that I make that black so I don't make any mistakes in thinking that that's a live wire when it isn't. I'm just gonna connect this under, mount the fuse, and then connect that up to the positive bus bar. It's not gonna take long at all. Just need to cut it to length, put a lug on the end, cut that one to length, and then connect both of them into my bus bars. And then that will be live. And then I'll just be sealing that up. And that will be the electrics for a while, I reckon, because I don't know where the lights are gonna be, where the USBs are gonna be. So there's just no point in running cables anywhere. It's gonna be dead easy to drop cables down through the counter and stuff and just under the bed and to the fuse box. Right, with everything connected, I'm just gonna re-engage the battery. I'm gonna put the solar back on as well. But basically what I want to do is if I just pull off this protective case, I'm just gonna use this voltmeter and I'm just gonna measure and see if we've got current on this uh, fuse box, black to black, red to red, 13.3, which makes sense because the batteries are reading 13.3. So pretty much exactly the same. There we have it, that's that done. So this is now ready to have stuff connected to it. It's not as neat as some people's electrics, but I've done a right job. I've cable tied up a few things. So now that's all up and running. Last thing to do is install this thermometer, which is for the um, solar charge controller. Just needs to be somewhere near the battery bank. So this little green thing just goes into the bottom here. A bit fiddly when you can barely see it. But there we go. So the temperature sensor cable comes out there. I've taken it up and then I'm just running it along and down and then of cable tied up all the excess and then I'm just gonna let the temperature sensor itself just sit down between those two batteries and that should get a pretty accurate temperature of what the batteries are doing yeah I'll maybe tape it back there this one that comes from the fuse box and the pump in there if I remember right I think this cable can handle 21 amps which is far more than I'm gonna need in the kitchen um, but basically what I'm doing is I've brought it all the way around and then I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to wire it into my fuse box. Basically, these are all your positives going down here and these are your negatives. 
I don't think the arrangement really matters when it comes to the negatives. What does matter is which positive you go to, you need to make sure that the fuse next to it is the fuse that you're looking for for that part of the system. And like I say, the cable is 21 amps, um, but the pump is six. We have two lights at maybe an amp each. So now we're on eight, maybe some USBs. That brings up to 10 and a half. So really we're probably looking at putting a 15 amp fuse. Uh, it should cover everything that's gonna run in the kitchen. In fact, it will cover everything that's going to run in the kitchen because I don't even think we're going to have USBs anyway. So I've got my box of fuses and I just need to find a straight off the bat 15. I don't know if they're all blue, but this one certainly is. So I'm going to put the fuse next to the live wire. So that's now fused for 15. Now the last thing to do is to go back into the kitchen and to put the fuse in for the pump. And I'll maybe just flick the switch just to make sure things are working. So that's a 10 amp fuse for the pump. So it'll work six amps, no problem at all. Protect the cover back on. Now this is in no way the final way that the switch is gonna be. Hopefully if I rock that switch, I should hear a horrible rumble from the pump and then I know that the whole system works. Three, two. I'm an idiot. That cable there is actually the cable that I put through to the front so I can install USBs. That's the pump, <laughs> so we'll do that test again. That's just the 10 amp in there. I'll see if I've got a seven, um, because the pump should only need six. But for now, that 10 amp fuse is gonna let us test it, so we'll try again. Hopefully this time, we get a rumble from the pump. Yes, excellent, all works. So that's pretty satisfying. Um, all the electrics seem to be working absolutely fine. None of the fuses have blown and my laptop's currently charging off the sun, which is great. But yeah, I'm spent and might call it a day. But next step is building that bed, which is really exciting. What I will have to do is, while I'm building the bed, is make sure and cover all of that stuff over with cardboard or some sheet plastic or something to stop sawdust from landing on it. Especially, don't want dust getting into the inverter. Successful day. You can probably tell from this video that I'm actually laid down. That's because I'm in my bed, which means it was a success. Tune in for the next video to see how I build this. And thank you for watching this one. And I hope that I've explained the electronics in a way that's relatively easy to understand. If you've got any questions, just drop them in the comments and I'll catch you guys next time. Thanks for watching.